coming up on 60 Minutes. This is romance scam times a million. Exposing the scammers. They are brainwashing techniques. Latest devious tricks. You can't believe your eyes. It's like a live deep fake. Yeah. How AI is earning them billions. We haven't seen anything like this in the world before. As more victims get stuck. I just knew in that moment I'd been done. From these secret scam factories. Pretty heinous and calculated. Absolutely. But they know what they're doing. Next. It's positive news, kind of. In the last year, the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, ASIC, has identified and shut down more than 7,300 phishing and investment scam websites. While it stopped victims here losing millions, the scammers are still winning, raking in billions. They're also coming up with more and more technically sophisticated ways to rip us off. Much of this criminality is now headquartered in the failed state of Myanmar. There, transnational crime bosses have resorted to human trafficking to amass a 120,000 strong workforce of scammers who, all day long, are forced to con Westerners out of their money. It's hard to believe what romance scammers can do these days. What's being calculated here? So you can see here, this is capturing your face and it's applying a little mesh to your face. We can see the, the green dots. Yeah. Um, and what we're able to do is take that mesh and just replace it with someone else's face. This is the latest trick criminals have come up with to lie and dupe victims worldwide. Look back at the screen. <laughs> yeah, wow. Oh, geez, that's scary. Yeah. So well, and that's mimicking everything as I move. Cybersecurity expert Liam O'Shaughnessy is yeah, the executive maybe. director at CyberCX. He's showing us just how easy it is to turn anyone into a digital avatar of Keanu Reeves. Even more worrying, how easy it is to change a face from man to woman. Now, obviously, That's... we're not we're not changing your body, right? So, mm -hmm. for you, it doesn't look very believable. But that's still terrifying. That the, the whole face has changed. Yeah. It's this artificial intelligence that scammers now use to trick even the most astute people who think they can expose a scammer simply by asking for a video call. And this is happening in real time. So it's like a live deep fake. Yeah, yeah. So we can we can take these sort of streams, stream it to a WhatsApp call, stream it to FaceTime calls. Um, we can also throw in some voice changing technology as well. It's incredible technology that's now being utilised here at Scam Central where old-fashioned romance cons are criminally orchestrated on an industrial scale. The largest operation in the world, where 60 compounds stretching 70 kilometres house 120,000 scammers, all there draining the life savings of unsuspecting victims globally. You feel disgusted with yourself and ashamed for letting this happen? Last year, 45-year-old Sarah found herself alone after a 20-year relationship ended. It had been decades since she'd even dated, so she was nervous about doing it the modern way on a dating app. This is Daniel. On Tinder, she met Daniel. Good-looking and a world traveller, the pair struck up a friendship. What was so believable about Daniel? I don't think there wasn't anything that wasn't believable. His photos looked genuine. There was no reason for me to not believe who I was looking at wasn't who he was. Very quickly, they were messaging multiple times every day. Sarah was keen to keep Daniel at arm's length, but he simply wouldn't let up. I mean, look at all these. Yeah, th there was just a bombardment of messages, really. When I think back and look back as we are now, yeah, there was just a lot of communication on his end. So was this every morning? Every morning, every night, even in the afternoons. I mean, it's good morning, beautiful. Mm. Did you sleep well last night? 8, 10 a.m., mm. 8, 12 a.m.? Do you have any plans today? Yeah. And then, obviously... A good morning picture. Yeah. 
It started as a possible romance, but over a few weeks, the tone changed so subtly, Sarah didn't even realise she was being duped into a cryptocurrency scam. How did the conversation shift from a friendship and friendly chat to you know, investing money and crypto? Yeah, that's a good question. When I look back, it wasn't there at the beginning at all, but then it be did become part of the conversation. And I suppose a small part of me, it sparked an interest in, OK, let's learn this side of him. Sadly, we now know this was all part of Daniel's devastating trap. So is this the first time he's mentioned? That's correct, time? yes. And I guess he's showing how much money he's made there. That's right. Um, when did you start dabbling in it? Maybe in a couple of weeks after those initial messages because he was quite persistent at it. Daniel persuaded Sarah to download a crypto trading app called CoinSpot, a legitimate platform. It was all part of tricking Sarah and making her feel comfortable with the process. Did you just tip your toe in to begin with? How Definitely. Much did you invest? It was a small amount. It was a small amount of $500 to begin with until I started to see what a return on that could be. So you're seeing yourself making money. Were you actually withdrawing any of that cash? Were you actually seeing a profit? Yes, I could do both. I could withdraw and make a profit. And that seemed a reasonable risk to take at that stage. But it was the next exchange account that Daniel told Sarah to use that was the moment she started to unwittingly transfer her hard-earned savings straight into the scammer's hands. It was a fake copy of a real website. When the money was distributed to this second exchange, that was where the mistake was. It's pretty heinous and calculated. Absolutely, but they know what they're doing. He was so convincing. What Sarah didn't know was that she was about to join a global list of victims who last year lost $75 billion to the criminal syndicates running highly organised scam factories across Southeast Asia. It's not just a few people behind this scam, what you've got is an industrial level of sophistication. You have a massive force coming at the rest of the world that is well-financed, well-organized, indoctrinated and, and capable. It's a transnational organized crime problem. Until recently, Erin West spent her days putting local criminals behind bars as deputy prosecutor in California's Santa Clara County Court. But that's all changed. We look at both at Cambodia and in Myanmar. She's now transformed herself into a saviour for emotionally and financially devastated victims. This is romance scam times a million. This is the romance scam that's literally going to decimate the rest of the Western world. It's a world away from your county courthouse. Or why have you decided that you need to take up this fight? Well, I would say that part of this is a world away, but I would say that the other part of it is calling me up on the phone every day and telling me what is happening to them. What we did in Santa Clara County is we figured out Erin's managed to hand back to local victims more than $2 million she's retrieved in stolen cryptocurrency. But it's a pittance compared to the $50 billion Americans lost to romance scams last year. With such brutal financial losses, there's an equally vicious nickname the criminals have chosen for their new global enterprise. They call it pig butchering. The term pig butchering is a direct translation from the Chinese term shazupan. The concept is uh, that we are, going to, we are going to fatten up the pig by developing close personal relationships and, um, and developing a trust and a warmth, and then we're gonna take everything from that victim and then we are going to slaughter them. Why are intelligent, smart people falling victim to this type of scam? I have never had a phone call with a victim where they don't say, 
Aaron, I want you to know I'm really a smart person. And I'm like, oh, I know you're smart, but you are no match for the psychological techniques that are being used against you. They are brainwashing techniques. You're a professional, Sarah. You're a smart woman. Can you believe even you got sucked in? No, actually. Um, still coming to terms with it. It's um, still very shocking and alarming to think about when I do. After starting slowly, Sarah handed over $100,000 at Daniel's urging. When did it start to dawn on you that you might not be able to get any of that money back? When I tried to log into my account, the account details were invalid. I sent the customer service team the link to the website which I was trying to log into and there was just one letter which was incorrect. And they identified that as, stop this immediately, this is not us. And that's when I knew that this was definitely a scam of some sort. What did you think to yourself in that moment about everything that you'd been speaking to Daniel about? It was just a, an horrendous feeling. I've got, I'm almost feeling it now again, speaking about it. I just knew in that moment I'd been done. We all know Sarah is the victim here. And we also know Daniel, the scammer, is not this man in the photo. But what we've never heard before is that the scammers themselves don't want to do it. They've been tricked, trafficked and enslaved. If the man who scammed Sarah refused, he would have been beaten, starved and tortured into submission. Coming up, we take you inside the scam factories. In a few short years, scam factories have appeared like weeds in Myanmar, set right along the border with Thailand. Run by powerful transnational criminal networks, they call what they do inside these walls pig butchering. But what most people don't know is that the scammers themselves have been imprisoned and made to scam. If they refuse, they're punished. Lots of brutality there. There's lots of torture, lots of beatings, and they force them to scam. Australian Michelle Moore runs Global Arms. It's an international charity in May Sot, Thailand, just across the border from the scam factories in Myanmar. She helps to rescue abused and trafficked workers. Do you think many people at all realise there are two sets of victims here? the scam than the scammers? I don't think the average person really understands that there is a victim trapped on the other side forced to do this. For some reason in our minds, we're convinced that the scammers are bad people and they're all criminal and they're all complicit, but that's just not the case. How far are they spread along the river border? Oh, this stretch of river is like 70 k's up and down. So On a drive down to the scam factories with Michelle, scenic Thai rice paddies are in stark contrast to the ugly multi-storey industrial scam cities just 50 metres across the river. It's an area which has now become a lawless region engulfed by civil war. It's not hidden at all. You can hear people, you can see people at this one. Yep, so behind us where all the black shade cloth is, they've put that up recently because you used to be able to drive along this road and you could actually see people being punished and uh, tortured in the front yard. There are 60 scam factories in Myanmar dotted along the river border. Imprisoned inside are more than 120,000 trafficked workers. For 17 hours a day, their job is to scam, to lie and to cheat people out of their life savings. How are they duped into coming here? The majority of victims are seeking employment outside of their home country. It looks like 
a normal job advert. Some are on, on social media, some are through websites, and then some are through recruitment agencies. So you've got face-to-face -face interviews with people. You might have a panel of people that you have a Zoom interview with. Then they send you an email, congratulations, you've been chosen to fulfill this role. We'll get you in touch with someone who will co coordinate your travel. The workers are sent airline tickets for flights to Bangkok, Thailand, where they've been led to believe they've scored a legitimate white collar job. When they arrive, they're picked up at the airport, but instead of being driven into the city, they're driven into the countryside. As they're driven further and further away from Bangkok, the city they thought they'd be working in, it becomes obvious that the job they've been promised is just one big lie. And as the hours continue to pass and their terror continues to rise, the question for all of them is where will they end up and what will they be forced to do? Seven hours later, they arrive here at night in May Sot. They have no idea they're right next to the border with lawless Myanmar, and that the following day, they'll be illegally trafficked across it in a boat. Worse still, when they get there, they'll be herded into compounds where local military will confiscate their passport and they'll be made to scam. It's a very well thought out operation. Um, we're surrounded by soldiers. Um, uh, all around the compound. Um, the soldiers uh, um, patrol the compound 24-7. 30-year-old CD from South Africa spent just one week in a scam factory. He'd been promised a job as an internet promoter. But after his passport was confiscated, he was immediately sent to scam school with a specific role to rip off the English. They told us that we we're going to be working as virtual characters to essentially sell and target customers. And we present ourselves as ladies from, the, uh, from, from England to essentially get the customers who are males from the United Kingdom to invest their assets, yes, into a cryptocurrency platform. So this is a photo of where you worked. Yes, sir. so I'd say there are about seven different offices from, the, uh, from what I could gather. It might look like an ordinary office, but there's nothing normal about what goes on here. CD gives a chilling account of the disturbing and grim criminal operation focused on stealing money from wealthy victims. They also try and get to know the customer's profile so that they can know which buttons to press. So they find people on social media, learn as much as they can about them so they know how to trick them. Yes, sir. Yeah, so what happens is that uh, the team leader, um, he will then uh, get a script out of the targeted person. Uh, we now have Mr. David Lark, 30 years old. He's got this amount of money. Um, these are his favorite things to do. These are his hobbies. CD now recognizes how fortunate he was. When he learned he'd been conned too, he arranged for his family to pay $3,000 to bribe his way out of captivity. Did you think you might not make it out of there? Yes, sir. From the time that I told them that I was no longer interested in this, I was really fearing for my life. The compounds literally call them animals. Um, they don't refer to them as humans. Michelle works together on the rescues with Judah Tana from Global Advance Projects and Amy Miller from Acts of Mercy. Between them, they're in contact with more than 150 workers desperate to escape. Hello. While we were talking to Judah and Amy, yes. a call comes in about two workers from India trying to get out. In that moment... Right. Two o'clock. Two o'clock. We join the mission to help save the trapped workers. I'm unsure yet of whether they've paid a ransom or not, so we're going to go and see if we can recover them and get them to safety. Okay, sure. thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Okay. Okay, okay. All right, bye bye. All right. Two o'clock. Two o'clock. We're on a mission in May Sot, Thailand, to save trafficked workers escaping from a scam factory across the border in dangerous Myanmar. Okay, Michelle, so what do we know about the two people we're going to pick up? 
So we know that they've been trapped in a scamming compound. They will be uh, smuggled across the river. International charity worker Michelle Moore has teamed up with Judah Tana and Amy Miller. We're still waiting on message from the one who's transporting them across. We've got word that we have two potential victims. So who would they be with right now? The, a smuggler of some sort? Potentially, yes. They'll be coming across the river, which is uh, very illegal. They don't know who the men are or what they look like. So what are we looking for here? Like a taxi or just someone standing around? What's... So generally they come in taxis. The drop-off spot is the public car park of the only shopping centre in Maysot. How long are you expecting this to take? Oh, this can all go down in like 40 minutes or it could go down in like eight hours. Suddenly, Judah and Amy are summoned to an undercover meeting with a new contact. Then, two hours later, good news. Mish, we've just got um, confirmation for the first time that they have actually uh, started crossing, so hopefully we should engage with them soon. Day turns to night, and then a phone call of relief. Ten minutes. We'll be here in ten minutes. Yep. He's going to drop them at that Roger door. That. Nervously waiting at the front of the shopping centre, Judah and Amy meet the men, but first impressions are worrying. He's hobbling. That's not a good sign. I think he might be injured. Yeah. He doesn't look that much luggage, do they? No, they've just got a backpack. Wow. The head must be spinning, hey? <laughs> yeah, they look weary. And how did you get out of the compound? How did you leave the company? So they were uh, asking for money. Yeah. So if you didn't pay that day $5,000, yeah. then they would beat us very badly. Wow. So since 10, 15 days, they were torturing us, 15 days. Mm. No food, no water, nothing. For 15 days. 50 days, days yeah. locked in the room. You worried about these guys? Yeah, one of them didn't look too great. So we just need to check him out, make sure he doesn't need immediate medical assistance. I see your eye. Is that from yeah, just, from punching? Just yeah. this poly bag covered my oh face. My goodness. And they punched you. Ten punches. Ten. In my right and left. Oh left. My see, this is now became little light. Oh Ten days before. Oh my goodness. Whole bag. Oh, whole body. This one. This oh. is with the rod here. Oh, oh my gosh. Wow. Rod. Oh, hammer. Electric shock. Electric shock. Late that night, the men are delivered to a safe house. By the time they arrive, they're just too tired to be interviewed. The next day, the sickening violence inflicted on the pair is revealed and they're sent to hospital. They were beaten very, very badly. They were held down and then hammers and metal pipes were used to beat their bodies. So they have a lot of swelling, they have a lot of bruising all over their bodies. Were they beaten purely because they refused to scam or...? They just weren't good enough at it? Sometimes they're beaten immediately and it's to scare you into complying. Other times you're beaten because you're not meeting your scamming targets. Neither of these men say they wanted to scam. They insist they were forced into it. In a recent Scam Factory raid, investigators found this script. It's a chilling reminder of the incredibly organised nature of pig butchering. It lays out, in textbook fashion, the one to five stages of scamming, even detailing what questions to ask the customer, how to gain their trust, and how to introduce cryptocurrency. As Deputy Regional Representative of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, Benedict Hoffman was at the raid and couldn't believe what he was reading. They're actually taught how to target these people. It basically teaches someone who would never have had the idea to scam someone in their daily lives on how to effectively understand and then use whatever information they gain as part of the conversation to um, get them to earn their trust and eventually um, scam them out of their money. Have you ever seen a criminal enterprise so sophisticated? We haven't seen anything like this in the world before. 
Benedict, when you joined the UN office on drugs and crime, did you expect you'd be investigating scam factories? No, definitely not. I mean, no one was talking about any of this at the time, you know. Benedict has spent the last 20 years fighting the profitable drug trade here in Southeast Asia. Is cybercrime now the bigger threat? We're seeing that the scamming industry and the scam centres are at least in the same range of uh, profitability as the drug trade, and we're quickly seeing it eclipsing the drug trade. You can target anyone at any time, um, and so the potential is much bigger. Goldmine for criminals. Yeah, that's right. Up next, closing in on the suspected criminal kingpins running the lucrative scam factories. There are opportunities. They are not going to be untouchable the rest of their lives. On the Myanmar side of the Thai border, civil war rages and the country is governed by rogue militia and corrupt police. It's not surprising then that criminal syndicates from Southeast Asia have made this area the base of their operations for drugs, casinos, and now the scamming of vulnerable Westerners known as pig butchering. Half a world away in the United States, Deputy Prosecutor Erin West has found herself facing off against this criminal underbelly. Who are the kingpins who are heading up these criminal syndicates? We know who they are. We know these long-time criminal gangsters because of their prior work and their prior convictions, and some of them have even been sanctioned previously by the United States. Erin's campaign to stop this devastating crime began when she started hearing about local victims a few years ago. It didn't take her long to realise this was no everyday scam, and now she's committed to bringing the big players down. One of the best ways to do that is to sanction them and to limit their exposure and ability to benefit from the United States banking system and financial system. There are a number of different ways that we can make their life difficult that don't have to include finding them and arresting them. In her sights, a former triad boss, Wan Kwok Khoi, better known as Broken Tooth. Then there's Chinese gangster, Zhao Wei. Another of the suspected scam masterminds was corrupt businessman Shi Ji Jung until he was imprisoned in Thailand on unrelated charges. And the way they've succeeded seems to have been by striking deals with the leader of Myanmar's border guard force, Colonel Chit Tu, who provides the muscle and the protection. They have different companies they control with different names in different countries. So they've set up a quite complex network um, which shields them from criminal justice institutions. Benedict Hoffman from the UN Office on Drugs and Crime in Bangkok is the man on the ground advising law enforcement worldwide. Do governments understand just how far ahead of the curve these scammers and these crime syndicates are? I think they're getting there. And the people that are running these places, they're at the forefront of a lot of the technological in innovation that we're seeing um, in the region. And they're the first ones to adopt technology when it's out there for their criminal purposes. So even if it sounds like out of a science fiction movie, um, they're probably working on it already. 30-year-old South African CD is one of the lucky ones. He managed to escape before suffering too much harm. But what he saw during his time in the factories was terrifying, especially their use of deep fake technology. Did they ever have to make video calls and change their face? Yes, sir, they did. The person that was getting scammed was getting tired of just texting and they would just, they would now want to either um, have a voice call or a video call. And so the customers, the targets were getting skeptical at this point about who they were talking to. Yes, yes, yes. If you tell someone, hey, uh, for five days in a row um, that you can't, you can't video call them, then you obviously start to ask yourselves questions like, what is happening here? So, like, I need to speak to you. Are you saying someone on the border of Myanmar and Thailand would be able to have this set up and it can be this high tech? Yeah, absolutely. Cybersecurity now, expert Liam O'Shaughnessy admits it's hard yeah, to keep up with the criminal scammers sort of who can easily create digital avatars to depict a good-looking man or woman. 
we used to be able to tell people, hey, you've been chatting with this new friend overseas. It's probably not that person. If you really believe it's a person, get on a video call with them. We can't make that recommendation anymore. What would your new advice be? If you're considering investing money with someone you've never met, there's a good chance it's a scam. Even if you're able to get on a video call with them, you can't believe it. You can't believe your eyes. You have to listen to your brain. For Sarah, it's been nearly a year since she lost $100,000. She now knows the scammer who conned her could have been absolutely anyone, male or female. Either way, he was definitely not the man in the photos. While the New South Wales Police Fraud Squad is investigating, she's already been told her money is gone. It's a really difficult thing to admit and speak about. It is. But this is endemic. This, it's happening to so many people, and I don't think people are realising what's going on. If I can make someone aware that this is potentially happening to someone right now, then I think that's a big part of my message. What harm have they had on you? You lose your confidence in yourself and your trust in people, and it is a crime that's been committed against you. And one of the hardest things is, is that I'm also complicit in that myself. And they're getting to people through one of life's greatest things, which is love and romance. Hello, I'm Adam Hegarty. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our extra minute segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.